yes, everybody's excited. Awesome. Uh, welcome. Welcome to the session. Uh, how's it going so far? Good. So have you seen that Christmas duck lately? It's under someone's seat. So if you can look at <laughs> if you can see if it's under your seat, you are you are the lucky winner. Oh there you go, we got a winner. A round of applause. We'll do this thing really quickly. Do, would you like to maybe introduce yourself and you'll get you'll win a t-shirt? Hi, my name's Alan. Uh, I work for Dyson, so come along to our, our stand and uh, have a chat about our products and uh, yeah. Awesome, welcome Alan. Uh, yes, we do have quite a few uh, companies out there, so go and check them out. So uh, we have an esteemed company for this next uh, lecture. We've got Stephen Pemberton who is a researcher at CWI Amsterdam, Dutch National Research Center for Mathematics and Computing. I've got these notes because I don't want to screw this up. So, uh, <laughs> um, so uh, Stephen has had a hand in designing a number of languages and tools that we use day to day, uh, day in, day out. Uh, GCC compiler, how many people use that one? Yeah, no matter what you do, it always gives you the same error. It's your code, not the compiler. So yeah, thanks for that. Um, and he's also is a WC3's chair of form working group. Uh, he's had a hand in co-designing HTML, CSS, XForm, XML, uh, just to name a few. So uh, thank you so much for doing all that hard work for us and uh, getting us great jobs. So yeah, cheers for that. Um, we did ask him to explain his job badly. Uh, this is how he explained it. So smart Alec researcher tells the crowd why 90% of them will be out of job in the next 10 years. But don't worry, we'll all be dead uh, if we don't deal with the climate change. That is 100% true. Um, we also asked him which book had the most impact in his life. Um, and he said, A-level mathematics, because he told a dad joke and his son threw it, it, threw it at him. So that's there. Um, so... <laughs> Stephen's talk is uh, about programming languages were designed in the 50s where computers were expensive and programmers were cheap, but now, nowadays it's the complete flip, it's the switch, hence known as the Moore switch. So Stephen's going to talk to us about how we can get the computer to do more and programmers to do less. Please give a warm welcome to Stephen. Thank you. It's, uh, it's good to be back in Blighty. Uh, that, uh, at conferences, people say, oh, you Dutch, you speak such good English. And so I say, oh, well, my mother was English. Uh, anyway, um, uh, thank you for having me here. Yeah, so uh, um, a little bit about myself. You heard some of it. But uh, at university, I, my tutor was uh, Dick Grimsdale, who bu built the world's first transistorized computer. He himself was a, a tutee of Alan Turing, which makes me a grand tutee of Alan Turing. Um, but purely by coincidence, I ended up at the same department where uh, Grimsdale worked. Uh, I worked on uh, uh, the software for research computer number five in the series that Turing had worked on. Um, and then <clears throat> moving to uh, Amsterdam, I got to co-design the programming language that Python is based on. Uh, I wrote part of GCC in de indeed, quite a small bit, but, uh, uh, but f at the time fairly essential. Um, uh, purely, again, coincidentally, I was the first user of the European Open Internet. Uh, it was set up by the CWI in uh, actually 31 years this month. Um, uh, and uh, and it, I just happened to be sitting next in the room next to the guy who did all the work. And he knocked on my door and he said, the Internet's up. Uh, <laughs> And so, uh, and so that enabled me to uh, log in to a computer in New York just to try it out and said, yeah, it's working. Um, but anyway, uh, shortly after that, and not coincidentally, I organized two workshops at the first web conference in 1994 at CERN, uh, which led me to meeting uh, Tim Berners-Lee, uh, and uh, he asked me to join W3C, where I helped in designing CSS, HTML, XHTML, RDFA, XForms, and a whole bunch of others. Now, looking at this, I can imagine, you know, you're probably thinking, whoa. But you have to bear in mind that, uh, that the life of a researcher is not that great. Uh, among, in all this time, there are only probably two days of me jumping up and down and whooping. Um, and, and that's because, uh, as a researcher, you're meant to be looking right really far in the future for, for, for things to develop. And <clears throat> people around you typically say, that doesn't solve my problems. And that's true, because the problems they have uh, aren't that far in the future. Um, 
uh, and and actually, uh, Gandhi. Well, the the quote attributed to, to Gandhi is is very uh, very attributable to uh, or usable for researchers because at first they ignore you, and then they ridicule you, and then they fight you, and then finally, hopefully, you win. Uh, and and really, it is a, a long battle to get these things done. Um, when we started, I mean, the, the research that resulted in Python. Uh, started in the mid 70s. Uh, I didn't join until 82, but there were people all around me saying, you know, it was crazy uh, uh, because, you know, computers were not powerful then, uh, and uh, to, to design a language that was interpreted, it was so slow, and, you know, people don't get the point. Um, uh, at uh, at one, uh, one talk I gave uh, on the importance of metadata, uh, some, a manager uh, or an owner of a company actually came up to me afterwards and said, <clears throat> um, I thought I'd better be here uh, tonight because uh, the last talk I came to were, was some time ago and you were talking about CSS and how important that was going to be in the future. And I thought, yeah, the likely story. Uh, but now all my developers are using it, so I thought I'd better be here tonight. So, you know, every now and then somebody does realize that what we're doing is, uh, is, is, is on the right track. Uh, it, uh, but it's not all as beautiful as it looks there in 1991. I had a, a research project cancelled uh, by, uh, by, my, by the management. And true story, last week the director of my institute publicly apologized for closing it down because they didn't realize what we were trying to achieve uh, and in fact he admitted we were right which is sort of cold comfort really uh, funnily enough this is this is quite quite like the steps in uh, in uh, dealing uh, dealing with uh, with grief uh, you know ignoring ignoring you is like denial and fighting you is anger and uh, then you win is like acceptance uh, i really ought to write a paper about that someday anyway uh, i like to use these talks to embarrass uh, some of my friends uh, in the middle there that's Hido for Rossum. this is a typical project meeting that's me in case you don't recognize me uh, <clears throat> you might have uh, you might have read he, uh, he retired uh, last week <laughs> Uh, and two weeks today, he's turning up uh, in Amsterdam to be awarded uh, a prize for extreme cleverness. And, uh, and we've got a symposium that I'm speaking at uh, in his honor. Uh, here's me arguing about HTML with uh, Tim Berners-Lee. Um, and so now let me get on with my, uh, with my talk. So as I said, 31 years ago this month, the open internet started in Europe. Now, I would con contend that we still think of uh, uh, the internet is something new. But on that day, uh, 30 years ago, 31 years ago, public computing was itself only just uh, 30, well, 31 years old, because here we go. This is the first time that uh, uh, a city council in the world installed a computer. This is amazingly Norwich. You wouldn't expect that really, but Norwich was the first city in the world to install a computer. This was an Elliot. <clears throat> uh, this is only 21 of 21 cabinets uh, that they installed. Um, uh, and, but this was a milestone in computing. Now, uh, not, uh, not quite uh, 60 years later, this is the same building, by the way, um, we, had, uh, we had another milestone, uh, the Raspberry Pi Zero. Uh, a computer so cheap that they could afford to give it away for free on the cover of a magazine. So we've gone from enormous extremes in those 60 years. So how do you think those two com computers compare? The Elliott ran for about a decade, 24 hours a day, but of course it was an expensive computer. They weren't going to switch it off <clears throat> if they could still use it. So how long do you think it would take the Raspberry Pi Zero to duplicate the amount of computing that the Elliott uh, the Elliot uh, uh, did in, that, in those 10 years. So, I mean, well, I'm not going to ask for hands, but, uh, you know, think it over yourself. Do you think it was slower? Do you think it's about the same? Or are these approximately steps of uh, tenfold? Uh, which do you think uh, would it, it would be? Well, the answer is five minutes, because the Raspberry Pi Zero is a million times faster than that first uh, uh, municipal computer in the world. <coughs> but it's not only... It wasn't only, or it's not only a million times faster, it's also a, million t a millionth of the price. So in other words, it's a factor of a million million. Now, a terabyte is a million million, so it's the sort of numbers that we talk in every day. Uh, they're very large numbers, but how long is a million million seconds? Well, it's 30,000 years, so it really is a very large number. So the factor uh, of, uh, of ability between those two computers uh, has, uh, has enormously changed. 
in fact, a million millions is approximately what Moore's law, even though Moore's law didn't get first defined until uh, 1965, it's about what you would expect from Moore's law over that period, except that the Raspberry Pi is two million times smaller as well, so it's much, 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 much better than Moore's law uh, would lead you to have expected uh, for those two computers uh, 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 to have evolved. Uh, I, I should warn you that uh, recently we, we went through the uh, 50th anniversary of Moore's Law um, and there were lots of, uh, lots of articles about how Moore's Law is nearly over, uh, which were all wrong because this is Moore's Law now. That's the or Moore's Law is the orange line there, uh, but when people tell you that Moore's Law is nearly over or is actually over, they're talking about the green or the blue dots, the single thread performance or the, the megahertz frequency, uh, but in fact Moore's Law just tells you how many, or just predicted how many components, he said, transistors, if you like, uh, would fit on uh, a, a unit area of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, silicon for unit price. Uh, so Moore's law is not over yet. And <clears throat> the reason why there's such a big difference uh, between uh, that initial uh, um, Elliott computer and the Raspberry Pi Zero is because when new technologies come along, they're normally priced too high. Um, it's often priced not on what it costs to produce, but on what it would cost to do the same thing with what it's replacing. So uh, a very good example is Edison. When he first introduced electric light into homes, uh, he based the price of electricity not on what it cost him to produce, but on what people would have to pay to produce the same amount of light using the technologies that they, they'd used up to then. So in other words, uh, 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 oil lamps mostly, or gas lamps. <clears throat> but now you had the additional benefit uh, of uh, instant light. It went on straight away when you switched on, and you had no flame, so it's much safer. So you were paying the same, but you were getting some additional benefit. But in fact, Edison was making money uh, hand over fist but because it wasn't costing him anything like that uh, to produce. And the same thing about early computers, they weren't priced on, on, based on what they, were, what they cost to make, but on what it would cost you to do the same amount of uh, computation using people, because basically you had just people uh, sitting around doing those uh, calculations. And so uh, you were being charged that same amount of money, but then you had the added advantage that the computer could run 24 hours a day, it wouldn't go on strike or whatever. So, 1957, that was when the Elliott was first uh, installed, uh, and they were so expensive, in fact, that nobody ever bought them, or very nearly nobody bought them. You always leased them. And, uh, and, and they were ex incredibly expensive to use. If you wanted to lease time on a computer, it would cost you of the order of $1,000 per hour, uh, 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 of dollars in that period, which was uh, an enormous sum. It was, it was several times the annual salary of a programmer. And you should know, in 1957, the median annual male income was 250 pounds, uh, females uh, 125. Um, that's not quite as bad as it looks, because uh, in those, uh, the women tended to work less hours than men. But still, of course, that's awful. Uh, and it's about time that we got back to equal pay for equal work. Um, but when you leased a computer in those days, uh, you would get computer programmers for free to go with it. It sort of came as part of the package deal. Um, and that was good because every computer was different. Every computer had a different uh, uh, operation code. And so it was good to have people in-house who already knew the, the codes of the, uh, of the computer and how to write programs for it, who could write programs and could also train people in-house. But the basic line is that compared to the cost of a computer, a programmer was almost free. I mean, the, the, the price difference was, was enormous. So... When you programmed in the 50s, typically uh, the programmer would write the program, copy it onto special paper, give it to a typist who would then type it out onto punched cards, or, uh, and then that result would then be given to another typist to type in again to make sure that the first typist did it right. And why these three people involved in this one process is because it was much cheaper to let those three people do, uh, do that, all that extra work than to let the computer d discover the errors. Now, it was in, uh, in those years that the, uh, the first programming languages were designed. COBOL, Fortran, Algol, and Lisp all come from 1957, uh, that, that time scale. And of course, they were designed with that economic relationship in mind, the relationship between computer and programmer. So it really didn't matter if a programmer spent a long time programming as long as the computer wasn't asked to do too much because it was the computer that all, where all the cost, all the price was in. 
<clears throat> so the programming languages were designed so that you would tell the computer what to do, exactly what to do in its terms. And it, the, the worry wasn't too much about what your needs were as programmer. The, the, the worry was about what the needs of the computer were. So 10, uh, ten short years after that uh, is the first recorded use of the term software crisis. Programs were being written that weren't functional, weren't being delivered on time, or weren't being delivered according to, to, to budget. Now let's uh, come back to now. It happened slowly, almost unnoted, unnoticed, but nowadays we have exactly the opposite position. Compared to the cost of a programmer, a computer is almost free, which is why I call it Moore's switch. <clears throat> and this is uh, sort of schematically what it looks like. Uh, you can see that the, uh, the, price of, uh, uh, the price of computers has plummeted, while uh, the price of uh, programmers has, <laughs> has, has grown uh, 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 constantly. Uh, so that we now have the opposite, um, the opposite relationship, but nobody's thought about that in terms of programming. We're still programming in programming languages that are observably direct de descendants of the languages designed in the 50s. If you look at Python, you can see the family re relationship to, uh, to Algol 60. Uh, it hasn't, hasn't gone away. So we're still telling the computers what to do. We're still talking in the computer's terms. So what I'm here for today is, is to tell you about uh, research we're doing in <clears throat> something that's called declarative programming. This is a process where you describe what you want to achieve, but not exactly how to achieve it. You're not doing any more the step-by-step -step stuff, telling the computer, well, now do this, now do that. You, you describe the problem much more. Um, so uh, I'll give you some examples. First, I'll give you sort of, sort of general examples. Then I'll go into particular examples. And then I'll give you uh, a, a couple of uh, very specific uh, examples of what, what this means. But the idea <coughs> is to give more of the work to the computer, because most of our computers are sitting idle most of the time. This computer is, is, is amazingly powerful, and it's at this moment doing almost nothing. So the first time that you hear something declarative in your life is at school. <clears throat> you learn how to, uh, to add up. You learn what numbers are. You learn how to add up, how to, how to subtract, how to multiply, how to divide. And at a given point in your school career, you learn what a square root is. That it's a number that when you multiply it by itself, it gives you the original number. This is clearly a very simple description. It's short. It's obvious. It's understandable. But it doesn't tell you how to calculate a square root. And in fact, nobody leaves school uh, in general knowing how to calculate a square root. <clears throat> because, I, I mean, that's not so important because we have calculators where we can just press that button. Um, or before calculators, then you had books where you could, uh, you could look it up in a table. Um, but but it, it allows you to understand what a square root is. It allows you to, to solve problems using square roots, but nobody knows how to do it. You don't have a functional de uh, definition. Now, if I show you the code, how to calculate a square root, if I hadn't told you that this was the code for a square root, you probably wouldn't be able to recognize it uh, because it's quite complicated. <clears throat> and. Uh, this is the essence of procedural programming, that you're trying to solve um, a problem and you're writing code for a computer, and the resultant code doesn't seem to have any direct relationship to the real problem. Uh, so when you look at this code, if you didn't know it was a square root, well, then your question will be, well, what does it do? <clears throat> but you have other questions like, what condition, under what conditions does it do it? How does it do it? What's the theory behind it? Is it correct? Can I prove that it's correct? Under what conditions can I, can I change this? Uh, 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 um, uh, what, what does it all mean? This is why documentation is so essential in, in procedural programming, because the link between problem statement and solution is so weak, because we've, got, we've gone through uh, uh, the, this translation of the problem into a, into a solution. <clears throat> uh, in fact, this is based on theory. I know the theory. It's very hard to see the theory in this bit of code because it's been optimized by the programmer. So the loop has been unrolled once. Uh, constant expressions have been evaluated in the code. So that if, even if you know the, uh, the theory behind it, it's very hard to, uh, to, to, to check that, uh, that it matches the theory simply because the 
I would say the program has gone too far uh, in optimizing it, and, and it's a, a, a typical mistake of programmers to optimize early, uh, because in fact, if, you, if, it, if the programmer hadn't optimized it, the, the compiler would probably have made a better job of the optimization anyway. GCC is a 100-pass uh, uh, compiler, somebody recently told me, uh, doing an enormous amount of, uh, of optimization, uh, much better than, uh, than an individual programmer can do. And, and, prog and optimizing in the code is probably uh, not uh, a beneficial to thing to do because it takes you some time to do that as programmer, uh, whereas it would only take a few microseconds of the computer's time uh, to, uh, uh, to do the same optimizations without you having to do that work. So that's procedural programming. So what does declarative programming actually mean? So I've, under, uh, I've explained the concept of declarative. So let me, uh, let me give a comparison. And so and this is the code for a clock that on your screen, you know, an analog clock uh, with hands that tick every second and so on. <clears throat> this, is, uh, uh, this is a thousand lines of code. It's copyrighted, so don't go copying this. Um, uh, but in fact, if you look at this code, only two or three lines there have anything to do with time at all. All the rest is administrative junk um, uh, to do uh, with dealing with window resizing and, uh, well, I, I forget now. Um, that, that little block down there is a, a table of sign, uh, sign values uh, so that it didn't have to calculate sign every time it uh, moved the hands, but it could just look it up. Again, I'm not sure how valuable that was. Um, but when I went looking, uh, when I went looking for this, uh, th this code, for examples of this code, I, I found four examples of, uh, of analog clocks. Um, and this was the smallest. The, the largest was four times longer than this. So it's an enormous amount of code for doing something that's actually fairly simple. So let me show you now a declarative clock. This is code that I will show you a screen dump from actually running, uh, running code. Uh, so we just dis say that a type, uh, that a clock is something with uh, three things, H, M, and S, which turn out to be, uh, to be numbers, hours, minutes, seconds, obviously. And then it's displayed as a circle around the combination of an hour hand, a minute hand, a second hand, and some decoration. Now, a second hand is a line of some length rotated by the number of seconds times 60 degrees. So the seconds go up to 60, uh, well, go up to 59, uh, and so you multiply that by 60 to get it to go up to 360 degrees. Same for the minute hand, uh, and the hour hand is a little bit more complicated because you, have to, you want to take the minutes into account as well. And the decoration is whatever. And then you declare a clock, <coughs> and, uh, and these are not assignments, these are uh, invariants that you just say the seconds uh, field of the of the clock is the same as uh, the system seconds uh, modulo 60 and and so on and so on so here's the here's a screen dump of that code actually running in 1993 as you will see um, uh, 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 and this would tick uh, every second this is running this is uh, this uh, screen uh, dump is from a, a, a sun uh, a sun workstation but it was running on Atari STs as well at the time so so that was that was the research we did uh, in uh, in the 90s into uh, uh, into uh, into decorative programming. That was the project that got closed down. Uh, uh, and but uh, the work uh, the research carried on. And what I want to tell you about is a programming language that that we're still working on, still designing, uh, based on the principles of decorative programming. It's called Xforms. Uh, it's a declarative system for defining applications. It's a W3 standard, so, so it is a, a standard, and it is in wide world use, worldwide use. You won't be able to see by looking at a, a website, for instance, or an app that is written in Xforms, but I can tell you some of the examples. In fact, I only learn this when somebody says, oh, um, yeah, I happen to know that they, uh, they use Xforms because I installed it for them. So the Dutch Weather Service runs entirely on Xforms. Many Dutch and UK government sites uh, run Xforms uh, legislation in the UK. Uh, the BBC, that's the BBC Sports app, which is written in Xforms. Uh, the National Health Service, I'll be talking about that example shortly, US Department of Motor Vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. So it's in worldwide use. Um, but uh, uh, what you really want to know is, did it, did it help? And so I'm going to give you three examples, big examples, of where projects used Xforms and they got huge wins. So <clears throat> my first example is a company that I'm under non-disclosure, not to say who it was. So all I can say is that they make huge machines once off. 
by, you know, by, by order. So uh, I'm going to say, let's imagine it's a shipbuilder. Now, it might be a shipbuilder and it might not be. Uh, I'm saying it's not a shipbuilder unless I'm bluffing you. Um, <laughs> shipbuilders actually do use X forms as well for, for configuring ships. But, um, but when, you, when you order a ship from a shipbuilder, uh, you say, I want a liner, I want a thousand bedrooms, uh, three swimming pools, uh, two cinemas, um, better make it two restaurants, no, three, and a couple of kitchens, and so on and so on. So every, every ship is, is, is unique uh, in many ways. And of course, a ship is controlled from the control room of the ship at the top, and that interface is very, very complicated to get that right. Because if you come into port and they say, oh, well, we need another 250 bedrooms, uh, you switch on another 250 bedrooms, but that means that that probably means that you've got to switch on another uh, um, uh, power generator into the bargain, uh, and you better switch on the uh, the second swimming pool while you're at it, and so on and so on. So th there are lots of relationships between going into port and suddenly something changing, and you're you having to reconfigure the ship, as it were. So. The user interface is very demanding, and they knew that traditionally it took them five years with 30 people to program the user interface of these ships. Um, and one year they said they decided to try it with X forms, and they did it in one year with 10 people. So we've gone from uh, 150 uh, person years to 10 person years just by doing it declaratively. So they've s saved an enormous amount of money as well as an enormous number of years uh, in, in using declarative programming. Now, the reason that I'm not allowed to tell you who this is because, is because they don't want their competitors to know how it is that they're able to cut their costs so, so greatly. Next example, this is a, this is a British example, um, an insurance company. And uh, I, there was somebody on their programming team who kept saying, you know, we should use X forms. Uh, I think it would really work. And so a manager said, OK, we'll, 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 we'll run a test. Um, uh, and so he gets, uh, he gets um, two people in, the, the, um, the manager for the regular programming and the, the, the person who's responsible for X forms, and says, <clears throat> here's the next application we want. I'm going to give you two days uh, to go away and work out how long you think you need, what resources you need to build the application. So two days later, the regular manager came back and said, Two days was not enough. I need 30 days to work out how long it's going to take to program it. And the x guy had already programmed it. It was already running. My last example, and the current, uh, the current poster child of x is the National Health Service. Uh, you may have heard of, uh, of uh, this project. Uh, they, they, had, they started a project for a national health record system distributed over the, over the country. Um, where uh, for, for the health records of, of, the, of the whole population. So uh, I'm told by somebody in, on, the inside, uh, on the inside of this that they had 70 programmers. Um, <clears throat> that link will take you to an article about when it failed, uh, where, it where it says that it cost around 10 billion pounds. The slides are already online, and if you can't find them, you're in the wrong job. Um, but uh, it costs around 10 billion, and, and the hardware costs alone were five pounds per patient. So it was an incredibly expensive system. And, and it failed. It, it, just, it just flopped. It, they did have a running system, but it just wasn't functionally good enough, and it wasn't fast enough. So, uh, so they dropped it. So one guy, one of those 70, reprogrammed it using X forms. The hardware costs are now one penny per patient. It actually does run on Raspberry Pis, uh, uh, and it's already been rolled out in five national health hospitals. So, so this isn't an order of magnitude uh, better, because, of course, if it fails, then, then any solution that works better is, an, is infinitely better. But in other words, we've got, uh, we've got really good results uh, out, of, out, of using, uh, out of using X films. So let me just give you an introduction to, to X forms, but only 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 an overview, because uh, I don't have that much more time. Um, so originally XForms, as the name sort of suggests, was designed for online forms. Uh, and, and we produced XForms 1.0. And uh, what we quickly realized once it was running was that we'd been, we'd been too slavishly following how HTML did stuff. 
and that if we generalized it a little bit more, it would be much more useful. And that's how Xforms 1.1, 10 years old last month, um, uh, uh, was born. It's now a Turing complete declarative programming language. There are implementations uh, from around the world, uh, Belgium, France, Germany, the Netherlands, UK and the USA are the ones that I know of. Uh, a number of those, about half of those I think are open source. Uh, we're producing Xforms 2.0 now, uh, which is just a further generalization. Uh, but uh, these examples use, a, 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 that I'm going to show use a sort of combination of 1.1 and 2. So. Everybody says, well, if it's not about forms anymore, why don't you change the name? And, and you know, we kept on thinking, well, should we, shouldn't we? But then we discovered on Wikipedia the article on form and content, and it says the term form refers to the work style, techniques, and media use, and how the elements of design are implemented. And content, on the other hand, refers to the work's essence or what is being depicted. Perfect. That's an exact description of how Xforms works, because it's split into two parts. <clears throat> you, the data and all its relationships are described in one part, and then the user interface, which is the, the content, is the, the other part. And it's very much like CSS in a way, because there you've got, you've got uh, style sheets, and the content is quite independent of the style sheets, but uses that stuff. And <clears throat> that's the same, uh, the same with Xforms, that, that you've got data sheets in a way. The, the, the model which describes the data and its relationships is quite independent of how it's actually used, uh, uh, and, and you get the same sort of advantages uh, from that separation. Xforms is about state, uh, and, and since most of its, well, since it, it gets its data using REST, that's, uh, that's good. You can have data internally, or you can get it uh, uh, from external sources using REST calls. Uh, what you do is you describe the data, you describe the properties and its relationships, and you can display any of those values uh, in, your, in your content. So initially the system is sta in stasis, and what happens is that, that Somebody, something changes in the system, whether it's the user clicking on something or typing in a number or whatever, and the system then goes out of stasis and of its own accord then puts it back into stasis, makes sure that all those relationships that are described in the model uh, are now up to date. It's exactly like how spreadsheets work, uh, but much, much more general, so that you can write general programs rather than just spreadsheets. It makes programming much easier because the system does all of the administration, uh, administrative work for you. You don't have to do that because you've described the relationships. So one of the amazing things is there are no while loops in Xforms because those are sort of part, uh, part and parcel of, of, of the description of the data. So I'm going to give you a small example uh, just to show you it working, um, just to give you a feeling for how this works. So, I've got X and Y coordinates in, somewhere in the world, uh, and I want to display the map tile of that location uh, at a certain level of zoom. So I've got three pieces of data, the X and Y coordinate and the zoom level that I'm interested in. So luckily, OpenStreetMap has got a REST interface for getting such a thing. It's got, uh, uh, so you provide the zoom and the X and Y, and it gives you a tile. The only problem is that uh, OpenStreetMap uh, uh, coordinates system changes at each level of zoom because it, it, it indexes the tiles, not the locations. So it gives us a bit more work. We have to know how big a tile it, it is, and then we have to calculate the correct index using our x and y uh, plus, plus the zoom uh, and, the, and, the, and the size of the tile. So here we go. So we, the data is x, y, uh, uh, and zoom. So we calculate the scale, which is 2 to the power of 26 minus the zoom level. Uh, the x tile is, uh, is the, the floor of x divided by scale, the tile, y tile is the floor of y divided by scale, and the URL is a concatenation then of uh, the, the server plus the zoom level plus our new x and y uh, coordinates. Um, of course, the, the, well, the, the, the syntax is, is slightly difficult, different, but that's, uh, that's, that's the essence of it. And the content, we just uh, input our zoom x and y, and we output our URL as, a, as an image. So here it is actually working. Um, I suppose I should have cached my, uh, my tiles. Oh, actually, uh, wait, that's, uh, that's nice and fast. Uh, so uh, so uh, the, the location that, uh, that I selected was, uh, uh, was, uh, was the watershed. Um, uh, so as we zoom in, uh, we get the tile at the different levels of, of zoom for, uh, for the watershed. So, as you see, that's a handful of lines of code. That's the basic bit of, uh, of code that you need to create a whole map 
uh, uh, interface. So this is not very much more. You've got nine of those tiles stuck together now uh, in, in three by three uh, in a porthole. And, uh, and uh, as I drag it, all that's doing is, is changing the X and Y uh, coordinate of, of where I'm looking at. Um, so it's a tiny amount of code. It's extremely effective. Uh, 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 I wrote this literally in a lunchtime um, when, uh, when I was at a conference and I heard that they had a, <coughs> a demo prize. Uh, they had a demo session and there was a prize for the best demo. So I thought, I know how I can win that prize. And, uh, and in fact, I did. Uh, <coughs> uh, but having, having got this infrastructure here, uh, then it's, it's trivial to say, well, show me uh, the transport map for the same area, because all I've done there is changed the site, the value of where, of, of where the tiles come from. Nothing else has changed. So by clicking on this, on this thing, all it does is change a value somewhere that says where the tiles are coming from. Again, it's, so in other words, it's one line change, slightly more because I've, I've styled it, but it, it's, it's a single line that's, that's, that works, uh, works extremely well. And I've added a few things. So uh, uh, for instance, uh, I can change the location of home. Oh, that's the cycle map for, for Amsterdam. Let's go back to the standard map for Amsterdam. Um, uh, but all this is really trivial stuff once you've got that infrastructure. So my conclusion, how am I doing for time? I'm doing very well for time. For historical reasons, pro current programming languages are at the wrong level of abstraction, taking into account uh, the relationship between the programmer, the cost of the programmer, and the cost of the computer. Uh, because programs don't describe the problem, they just describe a single solution to that problem. And it's very hard to, to go backwards from the code and work out what the actual problem is. Uh, you have to have that documented somewhere. Declarative programming, as I hope I've demonstrated with those three very large examples, allows programmers to be at least 10 times more productive. That what you can now write in a week, you would do in a morning, uh, or, and what now takes a month would take only a couple of days. I believe that in 100 years' time, everybody will be, uh, well, assuming we don't all die because of uh, the climate crisis, uh, that everybody will be de programming declaratively, just because it's just so much easier. It's, you get so, uh, so fewer bugs, uh, it's so much easier to get things going. I believe that eventually everyone will program declaratively. You get fewer errors, more time, more productivity. And that's the end of my talk. Thanks so much for that great talk. I uh, learned quite a lot there. Do we have any questions? I have a question to yeah. kick it off. Sure. So declarative programming, excellent, looks great. I can write it in a few few lines. How does how does that compete with what we're seeing nowadays, where we're getting these tools from deep learning that okay, take a screenshot, oh, this this thing will write me a, a program. You have to uh, train it beforehand with tons of data. That seems to be sexier compared to X forms. What, what do you what do you think is your opinion on that? Well, I'm not talking about sex. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, the, 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 there, are, there are two issues there. Firstly, the training takes time anyway. Um, uh, and secondly, you're not so much in control of it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, uh, I'm, I'm not yet convinced that you can do any better uh, using training like that uh, than, just, than just writing it down yourself. Since you know what you want, and just giving examples, you, it, it's, it's hard to prove that it covers all your cases. Um, learning models are, are, are hard to, to, to find out what, uh, what they really do. But, you know, uh, these, these, are, these are two different approaches. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that AI will be writing programs in the future. And I just hope, how much time have we got? Uh, we, we've got time. Uh, so the singularity, you've, you've surely all heard of the singularity, that, that when my grandfather was born, there were two modern technologies in his house. One was uh, running, well, not in his house. One, uh, no, sorry, in, in society. One was trains that, that we still have. Um, uh, and. Uh, 
uh, and the other was photography, which, which we still have. Those were the two modern technologies then. In his lifetime from 1980, uh, uh, 1880 onwards, he saw an incredible number of new technologies coming along. Film, mov uh, yeah, movies, uh, uh, radio, television, um, computers, uh, electronic money, uh, cars. Um, and you would say, well, if, he only, if there were only two modern technologies then, and there were so many when, uh, when he died, uh, are changes in society accelerating? And so, uh, so somebody actually did research into that and found that, uh, and by looking at over a historical period of, 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 of th uh, tens or maybe hundreds of thousands of years, found that indeed technology is accelerating, um, uh, uh, exp exponentially actually. And that means that if he saw new, um, uh, new uh, technologies uh, every 50 years, uh, that after 50 years, they'd be every 25 years. And after 25 years, they'd be every 12 and a half years, and so on. <clears throat> and so if you draw that line, and, uh, and the, that line is actually fairly straight all the way down to the x-axis, that sometime in our lifetimes, maybe not mine, but certainly most of yours, that line reaches the x-axis, which means that we'll be getting paradigm changes every day. Now, what can that possibly mean? And one, one possible answer to that is that that's when computers get smarter than us, that they start producing the paradigm shifts rather than, rather than we doing it, that our, we've programmed our computers and they've become intelligent and they become more intelligent than us. And the risk is that once they do become more intelligent than us, they, can, they solve our problems <clears throat> and realize that most of our problems are caused by us. And by that time, computers will be in control of all the infrastructure in the world. And I, I, I mean, you know, you might laugh, but I am serious about this, that if we don't plan for the day that computers become more, more intelligent than us, that, they, that we may end up being this, that, 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 that our economic relationships swaps around the other way, that rather than they being our slaves, we become their slaves, or at least in contro being controlled by them. So I think that AI can do a lot for us, but I don't believe that we're planning for the worst case. That was a long, no, that was, that long was answer to one so question. So basically, X form good, AI bad. That's I, I'm not, I, uh, <laughs> uh, thanks for your talk today. My name is Laura Lefebvre from Encore. Um, there's a long history, uh, certainly at the University of Bristol, in uh, research and declarative programming uh, since the 1990s. In fact, um, John Lloyd, John Gallagher here. And I was part of that. My own PhD was in declarative programming. Cool. It's wonderful to see the progress. But there hasn't been a lot of progress in declarative programming in industry in the last 20 years, one would perhaps position. <laughs> uh, what's been preventing it, in your opinion? Programmers. <laughs> you know, if, I, if you introduce a new, new um, technology that says this might put 90% of you out of work, then the programmers are not going to be very enthusiastic about that. The managers are going to ask the programmers, should, should we be doing this? And the programmers are going to look at it and say, and realize that A, all the investment that they put into learning the old way of doing things becomes valueless. And B, maybe they themselves will become valueless. So I, I, th this, is, this is the case with any disruptive technology that the old technologists will fight tooth and nail to stop it. Um, so uh, so I, 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 think, I think that that's, that's why it hasn't taken firm footing yet in industry. So what will change? I think, I think inevitably it has to. I mean, you know, Kodak went out of business for, for exactly the same reasons. I mean, they fought against digital photography until they had nothing left to fight with. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Is it, is it question? Yeah. 
Hi, uh, Emily. Maybe you knew that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so you spoke a lot about different research projects and uh, kind of uncovering new ground. How yeah. is it that you decide what to work on? Uh, I'm, I'm very lucky that my 10% time is 100% time. <laughs> Um, for those of you who weren't here, that was her talk, 10% time. Um, uh, so, so uh, of course, there are managers uh, above me. Um, uh, uh, if, if you get sufficient amount of success in your research, then they'll sort of leave you alone a bit more than, than, than right in the beginning. Um, uh, if you bring in money, they'll leave you alone as well. Um, but then how do you pick? Uh, how do I pick? Uh, I do the things that really I like. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I've, I've loved programming languages from the start. That's how I got involved with ABC and Les Python and now Xforms. Uh, yeah, uh, just stuff that's really fun. So um, um, uh, where I can see that there can be improvements. Thank you. Hi, Pete Hallett from Encore. Um, just going back to Laura's first question and then your follow-up about programmers becoming out of work. Um, <laughs> my problem is, actually, I need to do more with the resources I have. It's not... It's, yeah. It, it, actually, I think there's going to be more of a, a movement rather than a you know, loss of resources. I, that's, I, that's my big, you know, the big problem. So that was my, that was my comment, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I agree. Let me just comment on your comment. I, I, I agree that, that I mean, I, I made it sound worse than it really is. But I, I think, you know, that as it, as it comes in that, I mean, you know, we need, we still need more programmers. Uh, and, and so but by making them more uh, efficient, then you can just get more done. So I, th I think it will only be advantageous. And I don't think people will be losing, uh, losing their jobs. Yeah, I quite agree with that. And then the, quite a sort of, sort of straightforward technical question. Yeah. So um, the examples you showed seemed kind of like they were leaning towards the sort of the front end or the top of the stack. Mm. Could you comment on the maturity of X forms and um, declarative technologies down through the stack as well? Uh, it's, uh, I, you, you, should, you should understand that this is still, a st uh, um, although it's being used in production, there's still research uh, going on in, in how to best do de declarative techniques. So, um, so the answer to how would you calculate the square root using X forms is not an answer that I, uh, not a, a fixed answer yet, uh, because there are, there are several ways of doing it, and we haven't still still haven't worked out what what the best way of expressing uh, that 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 problem. Uh, in a declarative way is because you you don't want magic. I mean, you don't want to say uh, it's the number x that so that uh, n times n equals x uh, because that that's sort of magic. You the, you've got to have some sort of intelligence there. So we we want we want you to be still have control but not have to have to have to write so much as as you now have to write. Um, but uh, there there are there are places where. Xforms is used low in, in, in the back end because you've just got these relationships between the, the data and the data comes in and you, you pump out the data the, the other side, the, the resulting data out the other side. So it doesn't have to be uh, presented at all. The, co the content card part can be completely, completely empty. But as I say, these, these things are still in development now. Yeah, oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> so uh, hopefully this is a really easy question, but as a, a regular daily user of the technology, which bit of GCC did you actually write? <laughs> <laughs> so it's a nice story behind it, because, um, uh, um, uh, what's his name? Um, the guy who's just uh, resigned. Uh, Stallman. Stallman, thank you. Stallman turned up the CWI. Uh, and so I showed him a number of things. I showed him the programming language that uh, that Python was to be based on, and he was not impressed. And I showed him another program that I was writing, which discovered everything possible about the machine that you're running on. And he said, "I need that." Uh, and so, uh, so what that what that did was, 
told you how many bit, uh, what, what, what the floating point, uh, uh, how that was represented, how many bits were in the mantissa, how many bits in the expon exponent, uh, whether there was a, um, whether there was an overflow trap or whether uh, uh, an overflow value. It did, it did everything. And so he said, can we have that please? So I rewrote that so that it would produce the machine uh, definition for the compiler so that the compiler knew what to, to, so to generate. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the machine device, uh, 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 the machine values. Yeah, yeah. It was that, my, that bit of GCC was recently uh, retired, uh, and that's largely because almost all computers are identical now. And in those days, what absolutely wasn't the case. Yeah, yeah. That was an excellent question to end up with. So I just want to say thank you so much for not just the talk, but the insights and the anecdotes that you gave. Please, warm applause for Stephen. <laughs>